Good evening, dear viewers. Welcome to this week's uh, special edition of Open Mic. Uh, our guest for this evening is going to be Ms. Shaheen Nilofer. Uh, she is the uh, UNICEF representative uh, in Eritrea. Uh, welcome to our program. And dear viewers, she is completing her working tour here in the country. Um, and that is why this interview is uh, taking place. You were one of the few uh, UN officials who traveled to reasonably remote parts of the country. Um, what impressed you the most and is there anything that you would like to share your reflections with us here in this interview right you know um there's a lot one i am i'm very very passionate about traveling and i um, loved any given opportunity to travel out of asmara to as you said to see things um firsthand and to experience what results actually means on ground uh, many things and i count on right from um, uh, my own personal exposure to the cultural context of the country to um, how these institutions how the functionaries how um, the school establishment the basic health centers do work i mean um, i must tell you uh, in, in one of the field visits that i went to foro uh, way back in early 2020, 2020 before the, um, the COVID hit, was there was an immunization campaign that was happening um, in a particular basic health center in, in Foro. Um, I, I saw women coming with young infants, but I've also seen um, kids on their own have come for immunization without father, without mother, without an elderly grandparents. They knew this was the day for the immunization and they were there, you know, on their own. And that was so impressive. So um, what is, I mean, that's just about an example. What is admirable is about an uptake of the services that is being provided. In many a places, you really have to push communities, demand for services, right? But here in this context, what was admirable is about there is the services that goes without any disruption, an adjustment when times like COVID did come. But you also seen that you don't necessarily have to work towards to tell people that how important immunization services are, how important that you must uh, take um, nutrition supplies for lactating women, for pregnant women, and for infants who are, you know, for mild or moderate undernourished children, uh, for therapeutic feeding and all of that. So that's one part of the story where um, you know the communities understand and value the services it's not that things are available for free so you know there's people lined up for that but they understand uh, valuing the, the services and you also seen the commitment of the people despite the the distances that they have to travel what also inspired me uh, was um, again uh, um, picking up the story from the barefoot doctors um, you know there's one amina from nakfa She's a barefoot doctor. And she was our first female barefoot doctor among the three female barefoot doctor. Now we have close to about 21 uh, female barefoot doctors. There are some of those, these female barefoot doctors who are mothers of three and four children, um, passed out 10th or dropped out of the 10th class. They went through the six months of rigorous training in the Baron II a hospital for barefoot doctors um, training, paramedic uh, training. Then they uh, also were interns. We were talking to them and the testimonials that I have witnessed is just so impressive. Um, the, the pride that you see when they recount how they've been respected by the community. You know, somebody who's being the low self-esteem, being just a housewife or homemaker, from that to being uh, able to contribute, being seen as a Messiah of the community, be able to deliver health services in the remotest of the area, carrying that paramedic bag with uh, her equipments and tools and stethoscope, 
traveling long distances to be able to reach out to the families, to children, to women. Um, are just remarkable stories. Um, you know, uh, these are not who studied in the best of the Harvards and the Oxfords. These are the Baron twos are Oxfords and Harvards of uh, of um, of these women and men who are able to provide the stories. So there are many such stories we've seen teachers um, who have, uh, despite the COVID-19, were um, concerned about one year school closure and they would make everything possible for catch up learnings for the school. Um, not mentioning about uh, um, children and uh, parents that we've seen in during our field visits uh, during uh, in Filfile and Habero Sada. Um, all of that challenges, um, the teachers do stay put on those, um, you know, not having necessarily the best of the living conditions at this point in time, but just staying put there because they know they are committed to a noble mission. Children are coming to the schools, we saw in big numbers. We hope that uh, the government would be able to make sure whether through pre prefab infrastructure is able to address in the remotest of the location, accelerate more schools coming up, or uh, really um, be able to, in, 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 in shortest time possible, provide school infrastructures in the remotest of the location so that children are able to do. So many stories about it. I am also impressed by the very cultural diversity the country offers, um, you know, and, and, and the seamless harmony that you've seen in this country. Um, it's very difficult often to say that, uh, you know, you belong to a majority and you belong to a minority or you belong to an ethnic community. Um, there's so much of love, there's so much of a, a beautiful relationship that is often witnessed when you go there, when you visit to these areas, um, not just from a point of view of the culture, uh, um, diversity, but also how inclusive is the character and the makeup of the country, um, you know, composition so syncretic in their um, makeup. Um, so this is something that I am. What I brought in as a takeaway is to making sure um, that our structure in UNICEF should also reflect that culture. We should not be all the very privileged ones from Asmara. We should be having a representation in our structure, somebody from Kunama, somebody from Bilin. It'll take time. We need to invest. I know that if you bring in somebody from Kunama or Bilin and you would have the um, same level of uh, um, interviews and recruitment process, not in my lifetime, I'm sure we'll be able to compete with somebody from Asmara who had all the opportunity. But if you really want to stick your neck out, then you need to be willing to invest for a certain number of years to build his or her capacity to be able to um, bring it to the power. So there is uh, so much learning that the country offers in terms of its um, emphasis on equality, on gender equality, on diversity, on inclusion that should be representative of how UNICEF or UN should look like. Ms. Shaheen, uh, how do you see partnership with the government and uh, working together with the UN system here in Eritrea and what potential lies ahead as you are uh, departing Eritrea shortly? In terms of the partnership with the ministries, aligned ministries, it's quite a positive. There is a high degree of a trust um, which is so very fundamental to any partnership. Um, we are very candid. We also appreciate the honesty and candidness where we hit a roadblock. Um, so we do, we, do, uh, we do hash out if there are issues where it's slowing down our ability to be respond to the um, needs on ground, um, which, is, which is where it stems from the element of trust in the relationship. Um, it has been a very, very uh, wonderful, I should say, a very positive journey so far that with all ministries together, we have easy access to um, ministers, we have our people, our colleagues have access to the technical level DGs and the technical officials at all levels. 
um, we are able to have consultations and discussions with them. Um, we do, as I mentioned, both in our low times, are able to bring our disagreements on the table. And that's the beauty lies about it, that we reach a point where there is an understanding of our each other's issues and concerns, or compulsions. At times, we are often, um, uh, you know, concerned about the timeline because there is a shelf line for the donor funding that we receive monies from to be able to deliver and ground to show results. And that often concerns us and we know that uh, the times it takes are much more longer than desirable that we think as things are not moving. So those are the issues that we bring on table and we make uh, them understand. And But we also understand that there is a need to um, conscientize our donors about um, keeping the context into perspective when such financial decisions and allocations are made for countries. So there are both ways um, to that. But uh, overall, in the past uh, successive country program, and as we transition to the new country program 2022 to 2026, um, uh, we rallied a lot about uh, what came from the ministries in terms of the priorities for the UNICEF country program and uh, UN cooperation framework. So um, an alignment of a purpose is clearly the bottom line. You know, we do and we do respect what the priorities and plans are for government, and we do make every efforts possible to ensure that it's not just about what funds that we bring on the table, but more importantly, more than anything ever, is about the technical um, support that we offer on the table. So that's where the value additions that we bring in to to our partnership. And the same goes with the UN. We are mandated as part of the UN reforms agenda by the Secretary General that there's a need for more coherence and a coordinated and a cohesive UN delivering as one. Um, uh, so I've seen in the last few years the more of a unified UN approach as opposed to each one of us trying to do their own in terms of its turf but we needed to leave behind. So a lot of unlearning that we needed to put us behind and need to move together. So the cooperation framework, the results framework of the UN cooperation, which is in alignment with the government of Eritrea's national priority, gives us that wonderful opportunity to be working together in the results group and against those uh, pillars that have been identified. So going forward, I do see that um, the, the road lies that lies ahead of us is definitely um, going to be a much more positive building on blocks on, on the previous experiences and lessons learned, which is very important for us to apply and not just about learn and leave it behind. And so therefore there is uh, the role of the resident coordinator to ensure that there's a more of us coming together than doing things on our own. There's a greater need to collaborate and engage, which is the global order. We cannot be doing anything necessarily on our own, walking alone in this journey, but we really need to bring our partners together. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you've been uh, in Eritrea for the last uh, three years and six uh, months. Uh, what are the top three things uh, that you would like to suggest Eritrea should consider if it's going to move forward? Right. Um, one, uh, there are three things that are top uh, in my mind is um, Eritrea should be able to invest on addressing the issue of neonatal mortality. That we should be able to, even though we've achieved MDG, but there are a large number of neonates who are, you know, uh, who don't necessarily see the light of the day. Secondly, uh, we need to see that uh, remote learning. I mean, digital learning is, of course, the vision should be with remote learning um, uh, that our children are able to access quality learning. And in such disruptions, they're also able to continue their learning without any uh, disruptions that we see. Um, third is about data. Um, you know, we need figures, we need statistics, if not for anything, but for our own Eritrea's measuring up to its progress on SDGs for children. We need clear evidences. Um, you know, uh, the 
the last that we've done and we make reference to EPHS 2010. It's a long time. Eritrea has made a remarkable progress over the last 10 years and we need to tell that story to the rest of the world backed by evidence, substantiated by its story of from its own homegrown um, you know, successes and achievements, right? Mm -hmm. um, if we are going to share experience uh, like uh, what can Eritrea offer to the rest of the uh, the countries of the region, particularly um, in terms of successes it has achieved in advancing the SDGs for children and that of women? Right. Um, the top one of the top most thing that comes to mind is about Eritrea's uh, remarkable performance on um, uh, immunization coverage. You know. As I mentioned, uh, it is over 95%, which is close to about, as per the government estimates, is 98%. Um, you know, despite the remoteness, the ruggedness of the terrain of the territory here in this country, uh, that's a remarkable achievement. It is important to understand how change happened, what led to the success, what were the reasons behind it. And if you are able to pick up the lessons from this example, then we could make similar results in other areas that we would uh, be seeing. So it's important for us to tell these stories to the rest of the world that um, uh, given the constraints and challenges and all the limitations that there are success stories to be told about it. Um, then of course there's my favorite one is about uh, it is not unto the government sitting in a smara to deliver results for children. There is at every level the engagement and participation down from the community to the kebabi to the sub -soba, to the zoba level and at the central level everybody is engaged. So there is an element of a sense of accountability and a responsibility and giving back to the community is very high. And that may have de been derived from the principles of equity and social justice, which is so central to Eritrea's mantra to development in, you know, in, in country. So that's, um, that's uh, the story that Eritrea could offer to the rest of the world. And we've also seen their, uh, you know, um, delayed but nonetheless Eritrea was ready at the global platform to talk about its achievement, did not shy to talk about where it needs to do more, where it needs to invest more, whether it was transformative education summit or whether about uh, its uh, accounting for um, on the SDGs for the voluntary national reporting. So tell your stories when you're ready. Right? Tell your stories when you have all the right ingredients. Um, tell your story from the context of which makes you proud of it, um, you know, uh, of its heritage, of what it is. It is about it, yeah. I want to talk about the donors now who have been working with UNICEF and Eritrea and who continue to engage in Eritrea. What would you like to say to them? Well, first of all, I would like to acknowledge and um, gratitude for the support uh, to UNICEF that we've been able to achieve, the successes and achievements that we've seen. Uh, I wouldn't shy away from naming some of the most predictable and long um, partnership donors like um, the erstwhile DFIT and now the FCDO. We've had Japan, we've had Irish. Um, uh, these are some of the key um, donors and there are a few more. I don't immediately remember in a degree of a difference with larger, more sum of money, uh, who really believed in us, believed in our ability to show results for children. Um, sitting in the headquarters, uh, it's often uh, you see things from a prism of skepticism. Yeah, Eritrea, you know, are we making the right investment in the right place? But we have these donors where, who are extremely, extremely uh, happy about the results that they have seen and they continue to support us uh, despite um, the challenges that we have seen in terms of the transactions, expenditure rates and all of that. What is important for us is uh, for the donors to 
um, align their financing decisions and allocations based on the context, understanding on the context. It's not one size fits all that you have a, I mean, it is important that everybody is governed by a certain mechanisms and systems and processes. They cannot be casting a different financing allocation for Eritrea, for example, but it is important for them to believe that context does matter. And so therefore, um, the flexibility on their financial allocations and decisions is important that enables at the end of the day the results that they would like to see. And we have examples of all of that as recounted with some of these um, donors that who have been supporting us for the last many years. Um, many donors are really interested and it's very important for Eritrea to also understand that these missions are very important for them to come and see because they're also your ambassadors to talk at the stories to the rest of the world at the global platform where such global financing decisions are being made. And I feel important that uh, uh, Every time there is an opportunity for us to mobilize resource for children, this is Eritrea's children's right to have those resources that has been mobilized at a global platform. Um, and important that uh, we are able to respond to such call for expression of interest and we are able to um, harness those resources for children of Eritrea. So um, believing in uh, Eritrea's story, believing in looking at evidences, we understand that uh, they need to also trust, which is very important and fundamental in any given relationship, is about um, that uh, no money is get sidelined for no reasons wherever. There's a high degree of ethics and integrity that we have seen, that every money that we have put in has gone for that purpose. Um, there has never been an issue of an integrity per se in this country in all our financial transactions. That our donors know very well. They're aware of the fact that how we operate and how the transactions does happen. There is an element of a frustrations and the high transaction times and the pace and the, you know, it slows down. But uh, at the end of the day, they see the results on ground and they, uh, they're very, very proud to see that in a country like Eritrea, we are able to show them the results that it was uh, meant for. Uh, all right, uh, Ms. Shaheen, I, um, on a lighter note now, I, I want to ask you, how is it like living here in Eritrea? Um, what were you busy with, if not work alone, and uh, what memories are you carrying away with you? Right, yeah, um, so it's been a, I, I don't know, I don't have the words to express. Uh, it's one of the most beautiful country that I've seen. Um, it, you know, in terms of people often talk about weather, the climate, but for me it's about the people, right? I mean, weather is fantastic, um, there's no complaint about weather, that's not a subject of discussion when you meet people, right? It's like English weather, so you talk hun one hour on English weather, but in Eritrea um, that goes without saying that this is a bonus. Um, but it's about the people, ordinary people, common people in the streets of Asmara, in the streets of Masawa or Karen or Barantu, anywhere where you go, are just um, exude so much of warmth and hospitality and uh, positivity um, that you don't necessarily see uh, any degree of, uh, you know, that you are a stranger to this country. So there's so much of uh, um, welcoming you. Uh, that goes, you know, that's kind of one of the best thing that I've seen um, that you don't necessarily feel rattled if you're walking late evening in the streets of Asmara. Nobody bothers you, but they're always, you know, welcoming you and, um, you know, nodding their head and uh, wishing you. Um, so that's one, uh, one of the most remarkable thing. The second thing um, that I was busy, if I'm not busy with anything else, was I... Wherever I had the opportunity, um, I've taken a lot of photographs. Um, uh, as I go over again and again those photographs and keep working on that, um, and I just loved uh, the the sheer opportunity my field visit had provided to, to me, both in the personal and mission visits. They've taken so much of it, uh, of those photographs. I'll tell you an example, when there was a lockdown, uh, most of the time that I was, uh, I spent working from home, from the, my balcony window, and I have seen on that stretch where I live in Asmara, 
um, there's particularly there were two people that really uh, have left a you know a, a, a deep imprints in my mind. Is this one gentleman who comes on a wheelchair, uh, bang at ten thirty, and with a, an assistant who comes and he and he is there right in front of my balcony and. Uh, greeting people, talking to people and soaking in a lot of sunlight and that's his way of getting out of the house to you know walk around on his wheelchair and wave at me when I waved at him uh, and many people, I've seen a, a blind man comes with his two daughters and he often used to take that walk on that road up and down you know multiple times going up and down uh, telling the stories to the daughter I couldn't hear anything from that distance but I knew they were so engaging and there were so many such wonderful um, you know uh, gestures that I've seen on the road during the time of the lockdown as if people were waiting for an opportunity to reconnect to what is it called the normalcy of uh, trying to meet people because they're not able to visit their families they're not relatives so that on the streets I've captured many such images of the people on the streets tells a very powerful story that no matter what it is important to connect people to people and that gives the utmost desire of happiness if not anything else. So I'm carrying a lot of these memories with me. I'm sure Eritrea will be on my mind uh, forever. And I know there's no such concept like uh, forever. Yeah, but uh, for me, um, Eritrea would be forever in my mind. If I were to ask you what your parting shot would look like, what would it be? Children first, they're the center and they should be be all and everything for the Eritrea. We needed to invest on today's children for a prosperous nation. Whether Eritrea is designing its uh, economy, its politics, its uh, culture, its socio-economic um, imperatives, whatever it be, we need to keep children in the center of the design of every development program priorities and plan. Um, we need to invest in today's children. And I think uh, it is important that um, um, this should be the ultimate and utmost desire of happiness if ever we have to measure the success of how a country is doing. And I would like to uh, thank uh, the government of the state of Eritrea, all the ministries that have worked in the last um, three and uh, um, or a couple of months in Eritrea for their support and for their cooperation, more importantly for prioritizing children. We make sure that no child is left behind, uh, whether it is, um, you know, Habero Sada or Habero Filfile or Kekrabet or Agmite. Um, I'm sure every child everywhere is being looked after and is a priority for the government. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time, uh, Ms. Shaheen, and we wish you all the best uh, in your uh, new uh, working post. Um, dear viewers, uh, that was Ms. Shaheen uh, Nilofer. She is the UNICEF representative here in Eritrea. And that wraps up this week's Open Mic. It is good night from me.